live. It's such an honor to meet you, by the way. Thank you it for doing is. this. Back at you. Is People have been very excited about you for a long time. And we're live. Yay. It is Wednesday, December 23rd, 2020, 501 p.m. And uh, I have a few unrelated announcements to make. The president has vetoed the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, for those of you who are not Congress junkies, the NDAA is however dysfunctional Congress gets, the one piece of business it always, always, always gets done. It has been 60 years in a row that we've had an NDAA. And as best as I can tell, in a world's collide kind of way, the president has vetoed it in a fit of pique because it does not repeal Section 230, which of course proves Kate's larger thesis in life that everything is ultimately about content moderation, even <laughs> so the so National well. Defense <laughs> Authorization Act. Um, so the good news, folks, is that Congress will override the veto of the president on this. Uh, and you will see, actually, that this is an issue on which Republicans will break from the president. And the reason is, uh, quite simply, that um, uh, uh, they uh, cannot afford to be seen as not supporting the troops. And the NDAA is actually important for that purpose. And uh, so if a member of Congress has one thing they fear more, than Donald Trump. It is being accused of not supporting the troops, particularly if you're a conservative member. So uh, the NDAA uh, vote will happen, an override vote will happen, and I think it will actually succeed. That's thing number one I wanted to say. Thing number two I wanted to say is a very unusual and peculiar uh, uh, fallout <laughs> slash coda of my um, uh, <sighs> of my um, uh, uh, recent Room interactions Raider with Room Raider uh, happened today when a mysterious box showed up at my house containing, and I kid you not, a second wooden pineapple. This one was not a gift from Room Raider, and it does not, you'll notice, have the battle axe buried in it like the first one. This one is a Oh wait, which one is it? Is it the one up there? It's oh, the one up here one. next to the larger pine. Yeah, it's it's up oh, here. I'm point. It. Okay. I'm point. It's right by my head. Actually, the top yes. of my head. Yeah. I see. There's a second pineapple. pineapple. Now, this appears to be a gift from a person in Connecticut, uh, whom, as best as I can tell, I do not know. Um, uh, and so, I want to say, for all. Um, lovely people uh, who have sent me pineapples in the past. Um, and I hope that is a universe of Room Raider and this one. Um, thank you. Uh, that's a lovely, lovely thing to have done. For all people who are contempl contemplating sending me pineapples in the future, uh, I've got one on each side now, so I'm pineapples up. <laughs> I, think um, I, I think I've got like enough pineapples. Um, we're not allowed to have fun anymore. We are allowed to have an overabundance, a cornucopia of pineapples. In lieu of fun, we are also allowed to have Heather Cox Richardson, who is, I think, one of the most demanded by the audience guests um, uh, we have since ever like had early, on since the like show. summer we just like kind yeah. of got taken away by politics and elections and disinformation and everything else and uh kind of lost our thread of having historians on um but so every, lovely to have but, you but every time we open to the audience and we say who should we have on your name is always one of the first two or three uh who who, who come up so welcome to the show oh it's such a pleasure to be here would you like to know the history of why pineapples are important in America? Yes. Oh my God. That is Please exactly why we, we had you know. on the show. You <laughs> land 
we planned the arrival of this pineapple for your episode precisely for this well, reason. Well, so I'm not going to talk about the history of pineapples in Hawaii and the islands, which would be interesting. But the reason that they're on door knockers, especially in New England, is because when the, the, the sailors used to go to sea and the sea captains used to go to sea, they would travel to tropical regions and you couldn't bring back a banana, for example, it would rot. But if you picked a pineapple, and you brought it home on your ship, by the time you got home, that pineapple would be ripe. And the way that you told your neighbors that the ship was nearby or that your you know, your man had come home was to say you, you, you had a pineapple. And so you put a pineapple on your door to show that your man was home, and then you would cut up the pineapple and share it with the neighbors. So it's a symbol of hospitality. You have a pineapple, you got food to give to everybody from the tropics. There you go. We can just call it quits now, right? So wait, so yeah, this is, that this was is the why fastest pineapple ever. <laughs> Pineapples are decorative objects. In, that's in that's why homes. they are a decorative object, and it's it's an old New England tradition from the sea captains. Yeah, they would bring home pineapples for their for their women and their neighbors. Wow. Not a lot of them; they would take up a lot of room. But you could, that was the only tropical. Right. You, did, you didn't. You wanted to leave more space for more whales, um, <laughs> or their oil, as the case may be. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, awesome. I big thematic yeah. question for the show. Um, I'm interested by how often people compare the Trump era to the immediate end of Reconstruction, post-Reconstruction, kind of redemption. Um, and so I want to start with the question, to what extent is that comparison facile and to what extent is that comparison uh, part of the part of the sine wave of recurrent themes, legit. Oh, I think it's totally legit. You know, so mm. one of the things that when I started studying Reconstruction, um, when I started studying history, um, I avoided Reconstruction like the plague because you couldn't. To me, I couldn't make sense of it. Like the African Americans are doing something, and you're not supposed to think about anything else. And then, like ten years later, all of a sudden, Andrew Carnegie comes from nowhere in the 1870s, and you know, then there are railroads, and then all of a sudden, like J.P. Morgan's running around throwing money, and it just didn't make any sense to me at all. But if you actually look at what happened to Reconstruction during Reconstruction, it's uh, it's set up where we are today. And the key thing that happens in Reconstruction is that people tend to forget when we talk about the fact that the Republicans during the American Civil War freed the slaves, you know, that the slaves had, had walked away from, from enslavement and then the Republicans went ahead and changed the law so that you couldn't have enslavement except as punishment for a crime. People tend to focus on that. But the other big thing, many big things the Republicans did during the war, but the other big thing they did is they created national taxation for the first time in American history. So when you made African-American men members of the body politic after the war, you did it at exactly the same time that Americans were grappling with what it meant to have national taxation. And that linkage of the idea that the, the, the expenditure of tax dollars to make the country better was going to depend on black votes made Americans link the idea that a government that works for everybody is somehow going to redistribute tax dollars from what were during Reconstruction white people to lazy, in their minds, African Americans. And that premise that gets established by 1866 and takes off in 1877, the idea that spending tax dollars on social welfare programs is socialism, and they literally are calling it socialism in 1871, and communism. That linkage is what drives American politics right up until today. Hmm. That is so interesting, and I had no idea that the linkage was that one direct, one. that far back. It's so cool. If you went, so so, what happens is that in I could tell you how would they get there, but in 1870, um, in South Carolina, it actually has a majority of African American uh, African Americans in the legislature, and they do the sorts of things that you have to do at the end of a war. So they're like making hospitals and schools, and they're putting in roads, and and they're actually appropriating a lot of money for things like prosthetics. You know, America was actually the world leader in false arms and legs and eyes. 
um, after the Civil War because we had a lot of experience, right? Um, but so they're appropriating money for that and they're mostly African-American in the legislature. Now, historians will tell you that those people actually legislated um, very much in a sort of middle-class white way. And, and I could tell you more about that if you wanted to know. But um, when that happens, people who don't like the idea of black rights begin to say, and they actually use the word, we have a proletariat that has taken over the government in America. And there's there's these very famous um, articles, including uh, the one that springs to mind, is actually entitled Socialism in South Carolina. So if you wanted to go ahead and do a search of a New York Times, for example, in 1871, the word socialism is everywhere and after the Paris Commune of that year, so is the word communism. It has nothing to do with with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Yeah, so, so this is yeah that's so Go interesting. Ahead, can we just can we just talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm fascinated to know I'm love like the evolution of language. And um so I'm just really um, fascinated to know like how it moved over time and if there was a turning point in which socialism I mean maybe it was maybe it was around like the cold war but it had i mean i have to think that it was before before that that kind of communism and socialism started to switch over or like the you know so when when was that precisely um but before world war one world war two yes so in america now now i'm not talking about world socialism right. and, and world communism which is a completely different kettle of fish but americans become obsessed with the idea of socialism and communism in 1871, before anybody's, before the Bolsheviks are even born, most of them, you know, wow. and, and they're of course behind the Russian Revolution in, in the, the early 20th century, um, and and it comes from the idea of socialism. The the word socialism comes from some of the um, the utopian communities in America before the Civil War, and um, and people who don't spend a lot of time thinking about utopian communities in America before the Civil War, one of the ways you remember them is the fact that one of them was the Oneida community in New York, and they made their money by making silverware, which is why your silverware says Oneida on the back of it. The, the community is long gone, but the silverware company is still operating in one form or another. Um, and, and some of those forms of communal living were called socialism, but it was, there's a lot of them. There's, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, what would be and, a better word for today to describe like what it was that they were, that they were describing as socialism? Do we have a word for it? Well, the, 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 those sort of communities, those those socialist, those ways they call socialist communities, they, they're really, I don't, I, we just call them utopian communities as historians. But what what happens is then that the idea after the war that um, that African Americans would have a political voice and they could could elect people who would make contracts that would build hospitals, for example, which anybody could go to, because they wouldn't be segregated or they would be for black people or whatever. Um, that that would be sort of communal living, if you will, that would be pooling resources in order to help, in this case, one specific part of the community. And so people who don't like the idea begin to call it socialism. And it, it takes on this weird American um, construct that then later on, when um, both socialism and communism, later on when those actually take on their, their actual European form, um, simply gets read back into America as if they're the same thing. And they absolutely are not the same thing. You know, socialism and communism on the world stage are forms of government in which the means of production are owned either by the government or by the people through the government. And communism is a form of of socialism, um, but it has nothing to do with the idea of tax dollars building hospitals. But hmm. I, so I'm, I'm. That's interesting. So if you asked the legislators in South Carolina who were passing these measures, um, you said before that they were actually quite sort of. Uh, like, how would they have described themselves? Is, they're Republican. Is, they're well, Republican. Of, of course, they were Republicans, yeah. but 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 that's a political party identity. What would what would they have described their philosophy as? Presumably, they didn't say they weren't Bernie Sanders saying socialism over here. 
No, no, they would have said they were Republicans, because this, mm. remember, is a new ideology that comes out of Abraham Lincoln basically articulates it in 1859 in response to a speech that James Henry Hammond, who's a senator from South Carolina, gives in the Senate in 1858, in which he says, listen, the way the world really works is that um, most people are kind of dumb and they work hard and they're loyal, but they just like to dance and eat and drink. And you don't really want them to have political power or really any sort of economic power because they're the economic engine, but you need to make sure that their money moves upward. Oh. Reasonable people who have good connections and, and they will, we will go ahead and use that money to move society forward. Those people are like the mud sills. He says, literally, the, the sills of wood that are driven into the mud. And Lincoln looks at that and, and he says, you know, the government can't do anything except to protect the property of those people at the very top of society. Because if they do, if the government does start to, to build roads or, or clear out harbors or build hospitals, for example, it's going to mean an attack on the property of those wealthy people and they will stop amassing power. They will stop amassing money. They're going to have to go to work. And then you're not going to be able to have them thinking great thoughts and reorganizing the economy and doing all the things that those people, those of us who rest on the mud still do. Lincoln in 59 looks at that and says you're nuts he says you know look at somebody like me the way america really works is that the government needs to put its resources to the bottom to ordinary men starting out it needs to build roads and to clear out the harbors and to dredge the rivers you know it needs to to give people education because that's where the real engine room of society is and if you if you put all the money at the top those people get sort of fat and lazy and they don't have to innovate. It's the people at the bottom who do. So literally this legislators in South Carolina would simply say, we are enacting the same ideology that the Republicans put in power at the national level during the civil war. You know, when they created our national uh, uh, public colleges and the Union Pacific Railroad and uh, the Homestead Act and, and you know, uh, put the uh, federal government behind the end of human enslavement. Yeah, I love this stuff. So, no, I can tell, and it's really your your excitement is infectious, and it also just like um, I it was it was one of my two majors, uh, Amer modern American history, when I was in college, and so I haven't thought about this in some time. And also, I as I mentioned to people on the show, I um, I was at Brown and I studied with um, Gordon Wood, and I took all of his classes, but he teaches kind of just up to the reconstruction and then kind of you know that's you know that's kind of the end of his three part three part series. Um, so this is kind of fascinating to me to kind of go through this again. Um, but what I'm kind of curious about is like, I'm very, like, how does exactly what you just described, like Ben's question about how you have like people that have an ideology, a very specific substantive set of beliefs. And then as you say, they define, it's one-to-one, -one, they define that ideology as their political party, right? Like they define what, you know, um, these kind of infrastructure building projects, not as socialism, so to speak, but as like republicanism. But now we have obviously like a very different conception of republicanism. And there is this, you know, you, this is a very basic part of American history or politics generally is that you have the classic switch kind of of like what Republicans used to be in the time of Lincoln to like, and like before Lincoln to like, you know, how we consider um, Republicans now. But like, one of the things that I've never understood besides just like the toll of time, was there ever a real turning point when that kind of, that people have pointed to where the language around Republicans switched over? Um, and I imagine it comes during, starts to happen during the reconstruction in this period where they're, they're kind of building out this party. Um, but is, is when does that happen exactly? So one of the things uh, that, that fascinates me, you know, I wrote a history of the Republican Party, and now I'm working on the Democrats. And oh, um, awesome. one of the things that interests me about the Republican, we'll see what happens with it. One of the things that interests me about the Republicans is that that idea that, that the government, that what they argue, what Lincoln argues really articulately in, um, in, a, in a couple of places, actually, it's really interesting that he argued the first time in um, at this at its agricultural fair in Milwaukee in 1859. Um, but then he goes on to actually put, a, he basically cribs from that and puts it into his um, first message to Congress. And when he does that, he, um, uh, the, the Congress is like, uh, what happens in those days is the messages are not read uh, to Congress. They are um, 
the, the president doesn't come. Theoretically, you transmit the, the message and theoretically the clerk reads it, but he never does. And they basically just say, oh, the president wants you know this, we'll send it to this committee and we'll send it to this committee. And when they get to this part uh, that I'm gonna tell you about there, someone says, what committee should we send it to? And someone goes, I have no idea. We don't have a committee on metaphysics. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but what he says is that if you put the, the way the economy works, unlike what Hammond said, which is that all the money has to move upward. What, what uh, Lincoln says is that if the government supports people at the bottom by investing in infrastructure, essentially, um, if it does that, people are going to work hard and they're gonna produce more than they can consume. And they are going to support people at the next tier. And those people are gonna be the merchants and the shoemakers and the, the, the small business people. And they too are going to work hard and produce more, than they can cons uh, produce more than they can consume. And that's gonna go up to the next level. A few financiers and a few industrialists, they're gonna hire from the bottom. They're gonna hire you know, people to work in their factories. And this whole cycle is gonna keep on going. The Chicago Tribune actually says, until every beggar is afforded a coach and four, we will never get out of business in this world. And um, But the, the issue with that is they see the world as, as they say, a harmony of interest. Every sector in society shares the same interests in economic growth, which sounds just ducky. But the problem with that is by 1872, um, it starts a little bit earlier than that, but by 1872, the real power in the political system is with the people who have money. And the, the reason for why that happens is actually sort of interesting that may, you know, people may be interested in or not. But people who have money have more of the interest in, in, in the Republican Party. The Republican Party starts to switch to them. And they start to focus not on that harmony of interest and on investing in the bottom. They start to say that investing in the bottom is socialism. And what you really need to do in America is to go ahead and make sure you're, you're pushing this harmony of interest by protecting the entire system through a tariff. But what, in fact, that does is protects them, the very rich people at the top. So that whole idea of everyone's in it together turns to socialism, the, the fear of socialism by 1872 at the latest. And this happens repeatedly in, in um, American history. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt claws back the idea of investing at the bottom and he by the 18, 1920s his progressive era has been pretty much decimated because of the fear of socialism and the same thing happens again after World War II with Eisenhower reclaiming the idea of um, of investing at the bottom and that changing you know pretty rapidly until you know by 68 you've got Nixon doing his thing and then Ronald Reagan really running with the idea you have to protect people at the top that's kind of a different question um, of how you get the switch between the Republicans and the Democrats which happens really clearly in, in the 1960s that's that's a question of who's going to control the white south so I, I, I'm really fascinated by uh, this is actually a, a subject I've like never thought about literally until this hour of this day, <laughs> uh, the the interaction between real and fake European and American socialisms. Um, so on the real side, you have the utopian communities in this country roughly in the same period as the revolutions of 1848 and uh, when the, the manifesto is written. So you have kind of the birth of kind of European communism as a, as a at least as an idea uh, around the same time as you have these utopian communities. Then you have uh, the sort of development of the socialist movement in Europe in roughly the form that we think of it progressing. But in the United States, you have instead um, the fear of socialism developing alongside what really sounds like a combination of infrastructure weak and, you know, investment in the bottom strata of a, of a capitalist society. Um, at which point European socialism comes back to America by means of the trade union movement and a lot of Italian immigration, you know, the anarchist movement in the late 19th and early 20th century. And so my question is, are these, are these movements that, um, that like how aware of each other are they 
are they um, are, are these words that we're using the same words to refer to wholly different things that then merge at some point, or are they, or, or is basically, or, or or are these in dialogue with each other in any meaningful sense? So that's an absolutely wonderful question and really absorbed a lot of the historical profession in the 1960s and the 1970s and somewhat into the 1980s. And obviously I can't do it full justice here, but it's a really interesting question for a lot of what I'm talking about here. So absolutely, yes, Europe and America is very much in dialogue, not just over the issues of socialism, but over the relationship between labor and capital. And so one of the things that people often point to is they say, oh, you know, Lincoln was a Marxist because he was corresponding with Karl Marx. And Lincoln was not a Marxist, but Lincoln was grappling with the same concepts that Marx was. Like if you look at the 1860s in America, and I'm a specialist in America, not in Europe, most people worked in professions from which they actually applied their labor to artifacts that were, or to, to resources that were in the wild. So you pull the fish out of the water. You, you cut down a tree and your labor literally added value to those products. And the early Republican Party actually called capital pre-exerted labor. That, that's the, the term they used for it was pre-exerted labor, which sounds very much like something that some of the people corresponding with Marx would have done, right? And Marx is, of course, a correspondent in America during the American Civil War. And he brings the the uh, the Communist International to America by 1864. It's got its headquarters in New York very briefly, and it continues to have um, to have uh, offices there. So there's certainly conversations going back and forth, but the the, the there's a real question: Why does um, which is actually really interesting in the late 19th century? But why does America not develop a really robust um, socialist movement in the 19th century. Now, there's certainly socialists who come back, and there are certainly socialists who are um, writing pamphlets and running for office and becoming mayors in certain cities. But the most votes that a socialist candidate ever got in American history was in 1912 with Gene Debs, and he got about 900,000 votes, which was about 6%, I believe, of the um, the overall vote. That's that's not a lot. You know, that's really not a lot. So the question that historians are trying to grapple with is why not? And the answer that they come up with was that, in fact, because of the, the, the safety valve of the American West and of the cities, that, in fact, there was not a, a, a lower class that was locked into poverty in America in the same way that there were in European countries, and that many of the, the, the problem with um, socialism in America with immigration was because so many immigrants in the late 19th century came from so many different countries, they didn't speak the same languages or have the same culture, so they didn't trust each other. So it was very hard for them to go ahead and create any kind of an effective political movement. There's also the fact that so many Americans in that period and immigrants in that period really did uh, see themselves as being upwardly mobile, whether or not they were. But well, all that, so that's, that's the answer for how those two things talk there. There. To my mind, they're really interesting at the turn of the 20th century, when in fact you've got some really smart thinkers in European socialism going, wait a minute here, there was supposed to be a revolution, why is there not a revolution? And that led to the idea of um, uh, thinkers like uh, Gramsci and Stalin who were sitting there going, wait a minute, why isn't this happening? And what they come up with is that idea that somehow culture creates a bubble, if you will, and Gramsci calls it hegemony, but a bubble that people can't see out of. And 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 then um, uh, 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 Stalin is one of the thinkers, not Stalin, um, um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, oh, come on, Len, uh, is it Lenin? He's one of the thinkers who says what you really need is about 10% of the population who can see clearly to pull people out of that bubble and to show them the way. And the reason that I think that's interesting is that's W.B. Du Bois and a Booker T. Washington. W.B. Du Bois actually um, speaks about Booker T. Washington's Atlanta speech when he says, oh, throw down your buckets and try and you know get along with the white people here in the South. And W.B. Du Bois looks at that speech and he actually writes to Booker T. Washington and compliments him. He says it's a great speech. But then he goes ahead and says to, to privately elsewhere, 
Washington is a great man. He's a great thinker. He's done great things. But he's not one of the 10% who's ever going to go ahead and pull this country forward to a socialist revolution. So yes, they're very much in conversation. But I think maybe it's the African American socialists who are more aware of what's happening in Europe. And of course, by the time of W.E.B. Du Bois in Africa as well, um, to, to have a conversation going. Yeah, that's such an interesting point. I think that there's so I'm kind of interested. So I teach property law. And so I'll let you teach a lot of classes that are kind of describing exactly what you're describing. And I think that one of the kind of the down, like, the, I mean, one of the pitfalls of property law in the canon of, of 1L like kind of classes is that people think that it's very an, like antique and for precisely the reasons that you say because they're all ba like a lot of the like our law in the u.s is based on exactly kind of this lockean idea of property and ideas around property and resources that um and uh use of resources um, it's exactly how you kind of describe, like we think of the whale, you know, a whale is a free animal, but it becomes property when you add your labor to it um, and you catch it and you kind of, you know, and you possess it and then you turn it into oil, then you turn it, you know, you put it on the market. Is there, um, I'm kind of interested when you teach, um, what classes exactly do you teach when you're teaching and how far do you kind of like in giving a historiography of the moment that you're teaching? Uh, how far back do you go about what historians were doing at the time and what historians have like thought about that moment that you were teaching? I feel like the era that you're teaching is a very, is one art that our conceptions uh, have changed in the last couple of decades and to how people think of Reconstruction um, and what kind of how critical people are of things that were done um, during Reconstruction. Well, well, here's a funny story. I don't actually teach a course in Reconstruction. I teach one course in the late 19th century that's called Race, Riots, and Rodeos because it oh. goes from traditional <laughs> Reconstruction um, through the American West, race, uh, uh, late 19th century cities, riots, and rodeos through the concept of the American West. Um, but when I first started teaching the second half of the survey, because I teach both halves of the survey, I, um, I did, in fact, do the whole historiography of Reconstruction. And, um, and it's very difficult. It's actually, it's a very difficult historiography. So I don't really teach that any longer. What I do teach is, um, is the political story, which is, um, I think, really undertaught in a way because it's one of the few periods in American history we teach by theme rather than by chronology. And when you put it in chronological order, for example, the fact that you really can't do the disenfranchisement of African Americans in 1876, which is really when it comes to full fruition, although it's been happening before that, without teaching um, Minor v. Happersett, which is the case about whether or not women can vote in 1875. So if you put it all in chronology, it becomes this story of America. It becomes the story of the conflict between you know, the idea that the government is supposed to, to help ordinary people, which is what the Republicans said, and the idea that ordinary people have been expanded to include people of color. And that, of course, we think about African Americans, but in the West, they're more concerned about um, indigenous peoples and Asian Americans, or Asians, they're not Asian Americans yet. Um, and that, that central question of, hey, this is great, we're going to have this new democracy and everybody gets a say, and then by 1871 they're saying, well, wait a minute, we're not so keen on these lower class people who are trying to take tax dollars, and, and pretty soon that turns into, well, you know, by 1875, you know, in 1876, well, maybe that means they shouldn't vote. And then, you know, you get a little bit further on, and then it turns into, well, maybe, wait a minute, maybe those people shouldn't vote at all. Maybe they're actually anti-American. And that means that maybe we shouldn't let them have civil rights. And then pretty soon, maybe they shouldn't even be allowed to live. And, you know, by the early 20th century, you've got lynchings. On it. You've had lynchings in different periods in America. But by the early 20th century, there's a concerted effort to purge from American society people perceived to be anti-American because of their political activism. And that's a really different moment than the 1870s KKK, for example, because people are proud of the fact they're killing their neighbors. They literally take postcard pictures of being at a lynching and send it to people like, I'm a great American, look, I just killed someone. And that's the thing, you know, you, you asked me early on about, about whether or not this was where we are in this moment in America. and. If you look periodically in our very recent history, I've written really alarmist posts where I say the language of dehumanization, that Democrats cannot win legally, 
that um, people who vote Democratic are are vermin, are are insects. That's something that Don uh, Donald Trump Jr. did a couple of times. The idea that they are um, selling and killing babies, you know, things like that. That um, that's the language of dehumanization that, in our history as well as in other histories, has literally led to death. And that's the point where I look at the the way our conversation is going in America in the present and say people really need to be paying attention to our history of reconstruction because not only can it happen here, it has happened here. Yeah. So uh, bring it up to the present. Uh, you've already started that, but I'm I'm interested. We've got a lot of really interesting questions from the audience that I want to go to, but. I um, I look back in that period and I see a lot of resonance today. I also see, uh, you know, frankly, situations that are unique to that period of time that are sort of dominant in those conversations. Like, I mean, you mentioned westward expansion as a kind of pressure valve release a huge one, right? This, like, you know, this just uh, uh, particularly if you're unscrupulous about whose land you're taking, you know, there's just a lot of space to, for people to spread out. Now we have kind of the opposite effect, right? Where people have this sense that they're, that the resource allocation is, you know, we're not infinitely productive. We're not infinitely growing. We're actually being outcompeted internationally, which I don't think a lot of people had a sense of in the 1860s. Um, and so what, I guess, what are the limits of the comparison in your view? Um, you're, you know, you make an incredibly persuasive case that the comparison has a lot of validity. Um, but at what point does it become become too precious? Um, so, so a couple of things. One of the things about westward expansion is that it is a safety valve and certainly perceived as a safety valve, but the reality was life in the West was very much like life in the East in terms of upward mobility, in terms of working conditions, in terms of all those things. So that's really a myth. But what is important about westward expansion is that what is available in the West, of course, is gold, silver and gold. And, um, and one of the things that really undermines the, um, the socialist movement in the late, in the late uh, 1890s and in the early 20th century is the opening of the Yukon, the gold rush in the Yukon. That's what really knocks the wind out of the, um, the, 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 um, the movement of um, what it be, you know, the Democrats at that point. Uh, they had been demanding looser money and inflation and, you know, to help people at the bottom. And the Republicans won with an incredibly dirty campaign. And who knew where it was going to go? That was 1896. And, and that's just when they discover gold in the Yukon. And all of a sudden, it just it floods the, the country with gold. And all of a sudden, there's, there's extra money. So there's a couple of times when that westward expansion actually really did manage to have an important change in the way people live their lives, but not in general. So, but the question was, where does this fall apart? Where do these, why is the present different than it is in the past? And one of the things that I think you're giving me the, the, the opening for is my story is always about democracy and how democracy manages challenges. And in our history, we've had major challenges, external challenges to democracy. You know, the first one in the mid 19th century is, um, the idea of westward expansion and that brings to the fore the issue of human enslavement it does not answer races issues of racism at all that's a constant so i'm not going to identify that as one um westward expansion and and democracy finds way around that then it's mm -hmm. got industrialization the end of the 19th century how what do you do with the fact that you know andrew carnegie's only one man but is he equal to the, the guys who work in his factory you know, you, you look at the differences in their ability to affect the economy and the lives that they lead, they've got to come around that issue. Then the, in the 20th century, you've got the extraordinary internationalism of the moment. And also then during, this, the, during World War II, the rise of, of nuclear weapons. And nuclear weapons is a huge issue because suddenly the, um, the inequalities in the world 
in America, but also in the world, literally could mean the end of the planet. And that's one of the things that um, that Eisenhower tries to come to terms with, FDR, of course, and Truman, but especially Eisenhower comes to, tries to come to terms with and say, listen, we've got to get everybody to a rising standard of living, or you're going to have a case where extremists will take over countries and get the control of the bomb, and they're going to kill us all. So you have that, and then now in the present, we have another major, major issue to overcome, and that is the change that the computers have brought to us, and that what this has done for the way people think. And I just don't think we figured it out yet. I'm actually somewhat hopeful about the idea that, you know, it, it, it's good and bad. We don't yet know how to put guardrails around it, but we will. And so what we have to do now is just different than it had to be in the past. The questions of democracy are the same, but the solutions are going to obviously have to be extraordinarily different today than they were to take on the issue of industrialization. Oh, God, I have so much to say out of like that one. Like I was like, first, I want to say you say like silver and gold, but I, I'm wondering where you put silver and land in kind of like in that quest for like the Yukon and the settlement of the West. It's like it was silver and gold, but then I feel like there was this consolation prize of like you could have a homestead or you could make your living doing this other thing. I mean, not a consolation prize for everyone. Some people genuinely went just for the land and like, you know, to have that. Um, but I'm kind of interested in like if you would also lump that in or if you think of silver and gold truly as kind of a like a sui generis, like kind of like resource that was that was thought of differently as a motivating factor um but before i quickly forget it first of all i wanted to say that um the book that you mentioned um that i apologize if not i did not know that you'd written this but to make men free history of the republican party um if i have put a link in the chat uh, you have a number of incredible books i've read some of them or parts of some of them but not not that one and so that is now on my buying myself it for christmas list and um but my other question was that I have studied at various points, just social movements in general. I grew up in Western New York, was very familiar with the first wave of feminism, did a lot of like research around that and it's my undergraduate history thesis, and then the Equal Rights Amendment. There is this very interesting kind of coupling in American history of African American and people of color movements of women's movements and, and I should say not coupling but grouping of women's movements people of color movements and I would say like and lesbian gay issues or other types of like sexuality issues and I'm just kind of curious if I feel like the the um the story of who was the first to become enfranchised it was it was um, it was black men before women and then women of color were the last to, you know, to get enfranchised. And then there's all of these kind of various types of iterations. I've always kind of like wondered and there's kind of a lore around social movements that there's that they're very slow and that there are these like the fringiest ones of of the norms or the last to have their their movement kind of put forward. And there are other things, you know, like. Uh, black men are going to be more likely to get are going to get the right to vote before women do. Um, do you that do you think that's a universal idea about or like way of thinking about social movements in the United States? Do you think it's an oversimplification um, of kind of to to think through it? Do you think there is many exceptions to that as you know it is the rule? Well, social movements are, you know, in, in entirely different kettle of fish, and there's three different ways I think you can think about them, all of which are somewhat interesting right now. So one of the things you talk about the fringiest, you know, this is a time when um, our old concept of the, the one-two punch of a social movement that you kind of want the the moderate reformers and the pe people more on the fringe because basically the people on the fringe kick up a stink and the people in the middle turn to the people of resisting them and say, hey, either do what we want or you're going to be stuck with them. And that's kind of an Overton window kind of way to think about it. I mean, that's, that's a much later picture, but the idea is you move pe people left or right by being more and more extreme. So you open up the window. Um, but one of the things that is interesting to me, I think, about social movements, and this is because I turned in my grades today, and it's almost 6 o'clock at night, and what the heck, is that um, one of the things that I was trying to do in the last book I wrote, and that is kind of a, a concept I've been working on a lot, is that it would help 
me anyway, I think, to think about social change or, or the lack of social change in America, not as African-American history, brown history, what, uh, women's history, whatever, but as power relationships. That and what I was trying to argue in the, in the last book, in, in a very, so, and it wasn't subtle, I didn't really put it in, but it was the theory behind it, was the idea that America, and I won't speak for anybody else, maybe it's more widely applicable, that American politics is best understood not as, you know, us versus them, but as a pecking order um, of, of a power relationship, and that one garners power through language by othering other people, which would mean, for example, that there are communities in which I'm going to make this up. Um, oh no, Latino I agree with you. I love this. I think this is so right. Um, well, keep going. Explains, I'm just like excited to hear you it, say it. It explains how it explains how sometimes white women cooperate with black women and sometimes don't. It explains how. Um, you know, you can have an African American gang preying on a Korean grocery store if you're well, actually you consider looking. Consider that at a class argument. Like it's well, not quite I the same as class. Everything. It's a little bit like. Well, but that's that's the real question. I mean, believe me, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. That's a real question. What do you get as you move up that 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 ladder? Because if you want to make it more universal, you could certainly envision a society in which the being the peak of society would be being a scholar. <laughs> you know, we're not there. But what do you get by being at the top of that pinnacle? And I've been thinking, you know, you get money usually, prestige, power, um, mm -hmm. uh, sex usually, plenty. You know, and the things you need around around food and all that. But um, but it's not necessarily class related it's power it's a power relationship and what one considers being powerful is not necessarily money um in, in american society it often is but you certainly can think of people I, I think you can think of people who are really powerful in society who don't have a lot of money um i think that that's completely true or have a lot of money and not a lot of power uh, oh, yes and so what I was trying to argue is that, the, that there is the way that you garner power is by manipulating people through language, by becoming, you know, be, be, by creating a reality through the use of language. Mm. All right, Daniel, you, you are not in your chair. You are hopelessly backlit. <laughs> um, Room Raider, if you're watching, this is the ultimate hostage video situation for yeah, you. I know, right? <laughs> um, uh, uh, and I, I think you should uh, ding Daniel on Twitter for it. Um, but the floor is yours uh, and uh, uh, your question, sir. Um, what themes or subjects in American history do you think are going to receive renewed attention by historians as a result of Trump's presidency? Well, the mechanics of government. Absolutely the mechanics of government. You know, so many things that people don't pay any attention to or haven't paid any attention. When did you ever think you would care about the certification of the Electoral College votes? I'm but, like, really? But you that's know? also, ironically, such a creature of the Reconstruction period. I mean, you know, the the Justice Department is an 1870 creation. Mm. Uh, civil service reform is the thing that gets, uh, 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 I believe the Attorney General was Horatio Hoare, um, H-O-A-R, don't, you know, people in the George audience. Frisbee it's uh, George Frisbee Hall. It's George Frisbee Hall. He's back oh, I'm here. I'm sorry. Um, and you know, like, 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 this is a period of where professionalism of government is kind of born, right? Yes, yes, yes. I, mean, I, just, I think that's. A, I will tell you if 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 I could throw something in here, though, for people who are listening who maybe want to do research. If I were starting out tomorrow, I would dump all this and learn Chicano history. To me, that is the most fascinating thing I have ever tripped over in the last 30 years. And I'm, I, I, don't, I don't have the time to learn it all. I don't even speak Spanish. But man, if anybody's out there saying, maybe I'll be a historian, Chicano history all the way. Wow, 
fascinating mechanics of government in Chicano history. I, I like was not expecting either. Well, a little bit. The first response: Would you put the professionalization of government in with mechanics of government? Yes. As like a topic, yes. Okay. I would, and mind you, mind you, there's there was a guy named Leonard White who wrote in like 1402. I, I'm serious. He like. I, I'm being mean to him. He was probably the early 20th century, and he wrote these volumes on the way the government works. And I was so enamored of them, I actually gave him his Christmas gifts one year, and like people were not happy. But he actually went and said, Oh, when they started the post office, here's the 15 guys who worked for them. And, you know, people used to do that stuff, and they just don't anymore. But they are now. The young people are. I'm writing, I hope I'm writing that to, for about like the tech companies right now. But yeah, it's a it's Indeed. a hard it's a hard road to hoe. Oh, yeah, people don't love hearing about that, and even when it's relevant, <laughs> like to their direct yeah. lives. So, hey, Alice. Hi, Alice. Um, so I was interested. So you were talking about um, investment in public infrastructure, like hospitals, and I was, and I think that there's a regional difference between, let's say, New England and the South. And I was interested in whether you think that the racial homogeneity of a region like New England allows that communitarianism to survive, or if it's kind of the opposite, where it comes up from the fact in American history. Does, does that? Make, I don't know if that makes sense as a question. And you can throw out the question. Does. And say, Here's the difference. It, it does. You're asking if there if there is if the fact that New England is more homo um, has has more of the same people uh, homogeneous. Um, has made it more willing to use its resources in a in a community based way, or is it a and, side culture issue of like Puritan? Well, so here's the funny thing that I would say um, yes, except um, a graduate student of mine who just got her PhD within the last month. Um, always says to me, you're nuts. You know, New England, you know, people hated the Irish. There were plenty of African-Americans on the seaports. They were just as mixed up as anybody else. So I have backed off that a little bit to suggest that one of the things that I'm playing with right now is the idea that what really makes the New England, New York area different in the 19th century is that the South and the West are characterized by extractive economies. And extractive economies tend to concentrate power pretty narrowly in a very small group of very wealthy people. While the, the New England in the early years of the 19th century, until about 1880, tends to be much more a subsistence-based economy. And that being the case, with a subsistence-based economy, there is less openness, and mind you, I'm just thinking aloud here, but there is less openness to having the rich guy in town saying, no, if we if we do this road, you're going to be taking my tax dollars. People are more willing to throw everything in the pot when everybody is more similarly situated economically. I've never written that down, but that's kind of the way I think about it. And only because my, my graduate student used to be like, yeah, right, you want to tell you want me to tell you how much everybody was white in New England? Look, and she's a statistics person. I'd be like, oh, okay, maybe you're right. So I had to start thinking about different things. Yeah, super interesting. Christopher, the floor is yours. I was first going to say uh, we had a little Chicano history and uh, mechanics of government last night with the uh, Governor Newsom's appointment of Alex Padilla uh, to the, the next senator from California. Um, yeah. My question uh, was going to be about uh, was there really a compromise of 1877 to resolve uh, the election of 1876? Don't let go um, of that question, man. This is our, we're, you know, we've got a sort of fake contested election going on. We, we, we would be remiss if we didn't sure. talk about it. And I wanted to add on to that, like, what do we misunderstand about, about the end of Reconstruction? Maybe. Oh my God, this is so perfect. It's the same question. No, there was no compromise of 1877. Let me tell you how we got to that. What happens is that after the election of 1876, um, in, in a number of states, but for the, our purposes right now, South Carolina, um, the Republicans insist that they've won and the Democrats say, no, you didn't. And so they argue and they send up two versions of who has won uh, the, the, the governor's office. And the Republicans hold the state house, literally, the guy lives in the state house. So they refuse to, the, the Republican who's in the South Carolina state house refuses to leave. And he gets, the troops who were stationed in South Carolina to walk up 
and, and surround the state house. And so the Democrats can't come in. And they, they, I can tell you how we get um, Hayes in the White House, but Hayes goes ahead in after he takes office in April and he calls both candidates up to the White House at separate times and on the same train. And he says to the, to the, the Republican, he says, I can't keep protecting you with the troops. And he says to the Democrat, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and, and recognize that you won this election. And that guy's Wade Hampton. And so he tells the Republican who insists he's won, even though he, he, he doesn't have the votes because they've been suppressed. He says, I'm going to pull the troops away from the state house. And that's what pulling the troops out in 1877 was. They walked from around the South Carolina State House in Columbia down the road to the barracks, which is now the reflecting pool at the South Carolina um, University of South Carolina Library. You can look it up on Google Maps and you can see it's like an eight minute walk. I mean, it's nothing. We never pulled the troops out of the South. We still have troops in the South. We staged the, the Spanish American War from the South. That is a construction that happens much later in 1890. There's a book written by a bunch of Southern congressmen led by a guy named Hillary Herbert. And he is trying to argue that um, African Americans should have no vote in the in the South, and that it was really important for the South to continue to be a one-party democratic state. And he's mm -hmm. the one who says, "Oh, 1877 is when Reconstruction ended," but he didn't give it a date. He and what he meant was that the the um, the Southern states all became controlled by Democrats again. We got the Solid South, and the book is called "Why the Solid South." And then, when I think it's James Ford Rhodes writes his big history of America, one of the first sweeping histories of America, he's the one who says it's the pulling out of the troops. It never happened. It's a racist construction of what what happened in re, in the Reconstruction period. So the biggest misconception is, you know, when Reconstruction ended and why? Because the actual, at the time, what people said was the end of Reconstruction was when the Georgia representatives and senators are sworn back into Congress after Georgia has, has uh, um, uh, ratified the 15th Amendment and is readmitted to the Union. There's an actual minute that Reconstruction ends. But of course, nowadays, we recognize Reconstruction as being a much larger Reconstruction of the American economy, um, mm. uh, it, its racial balances, its, its geography. And I have heard people argue everything from the fact that lasted to about 1901 to the idea it's still going on today. And I could make a case either way for that. All right, we got I mean, three your, more your questions book says to go. One, right? If I'm remembering yeah, that correctly, was, like you kind of, yeah, yeah, okay. like three, but like you're kind of, have you moved on it a little? Yeah. Um, it depends what I'm arguing. I did write a, a piece that nobody's ever seen and ever, never will see because it's in a book that costs like a gazillion dollars. But I talked a lot about the periodization of, of Reconstruction and, Gild, and the Gilded Age mm. and why, where I thought the date should be. Richard, you get the uh, An ultimate? Penola, yeah. ultimate question. <laughs> anti penultimate yes. um so i i just want to thank thank you for writing such a timely book um a couple of years ago I, it started dawning on me that yeah maybe the south did win after all and i've seen a number of friends thinking the same thing and i'm thinking like like are we crazy and now i now i know that uh, i'm not crazy um but and in that light i was wondering when you started to write um, or when you started to conceive the idea for this book and how the Trump and even the Obama years uh, brought issues into focus or into prominence that you might have considered peripheral in the past. You know, I will, I will confess it's a little hard for me to remember when this book started, the, the last book, the, the How the South Won the Civil War, because I tend to think about books for a really long time before I actually write them. I wrote it very quickly, and everyone was always like, oh, you write so quickly. It's like, well, that's because I think about it for a decade first. Um, <laughs> I, I, think what, I think what really started me thinking about it was just the language not only of um, of the Confederacy in terms of flying the Confederate flag, which, which by the way, is, has a really interesting history that was not always negative. If you remember, the um, one of the things that's interesting is that um, the Allman Brothers and the Allman Brothers Band and um, uh, um, Charlie Daniels and um, uh, Leonard Skinner all campaigned for uh, Jimmy Carter in 76. 
Um, so you think about that and you think, wait a minute here, Leonard Skinner with its Confederate flags everywhere, I was just campaign say, for Jimmy yeah. Carter. Yeah. yeah so, but I mean, that, isn't I, like there a line about Wallace, like a pro Wallace line and and Freebird? Um, yeah, and, and that we don't have time to go into. But but the point simply being that I, I certainly was focusing on that and on the on the the lionization of Confederate heroes and Confederate statues, which frankly is just weird. You know, what country puts up statues of the people who tried to destroy it and took six hundred thousand lives? And almost six billion dollars, which is a huge sum at the time. I mean, it's still pretty big to me. Um, so I thought about that, but what's more interesting to me, I think, and why I thought about it so was that was the language of people like Barry Goldwater. Because in Barry Goldwater's conscience of a conservative, he quite literally sounds like James Henry Hammond. He is making the mm -hmm. same arguments about the power of the federal government that James Henry Hammond was. And I said that in, in in the Republican book, and a lot of people got really angry about it. And I'm like, prove me wrong. I mean, I'm reading this, and I have no emotional attachment to either of these men. I'm examining these as documents, and I'm saying they're saying the same thing. So how did we get here? If we are here, how did we get here? And that was that. I think it was fed a lot by the the work I do in general about trying to get to the zeitgeist of a time, but also with the realization, really since Rush Limbaugh that language really matters and the the right has understood this for a very long time and i think the left was later to come to that but i, I really wanted to grapple with how language has reordered our politics and our society and bring it to people's attention because i think that that's really how people as i say garnered power so that's i think where it came from um a, a long time ago now hmm. mr botts the floor is yours Professor, thank you so much. This has been extremely uh, interesting and educational. Um, can you provide a little bit of a historical perspective on current American policing and discuss linkages to night patrols following the Civil War? Yes, um, the, although not as much as I would have if I'd known that question was coming because I've written on it, but not recently. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yes, in fact, there is a link between modern day um, um, policing and the not not just the night patrols, but also the slave patrols, because the slave patrols are essentially the police from before the Civil War in the South. But that's not actually where American policing starts. American policing actually starts in urban areas earlier than that. Um, but I think the, the 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 this goes back to the the power question that I was talking about earlier. In both cases, um, there is a question of one group of people imposing um, a way of life and an ordering system on another. It's just that in the North, they tend to be poor people, especially in urban areas that are the, the guys who live on the waterfront, you know, the sailors from other countries, um, the people who are drifters who tend to be around a waterfront in the seaport towns in colonial America. And in the South, more often, it is, it is racially based. Although in the North, as my former graduate student would say, they were talking about Irish people and the Africans who came in on the boats and, and the different races who were there in the seaports. So maybe that's not as clear a line as one would like it to be to make this argument. Mm. But in every case, American policing, if you actually look at the statistics, is much less about crime, much less about crime traditionally than it is about enforcing property rights and a certain kind of order um, on society. So people are more likely to be arrested for being disorderly, for, you know, for rioting, for being in the streets than they are for actually committing violent crimes, for example. So my only take on policing there is is that it does tend to reinforce a certain kind of power structure and that the the question that I'm interested in grappling with is who runs the power structure. I will say there's a very interesting book on these shelves actually I just read recently about it's by a woman named Sarah C O S E O Sarah C O and it's about how um, uh, if you think about policing like policing really didn't affect many people for a long time. Because unless you lived in an urban area, when would you see a police officer, a law enforcement officer? I mean, there's a sheriff in the town, but and if you're an African American in the in you're on the roads, yeah. But how often are you gonna be on the roads? She makes the case that Americans' interaction with policing really takes off once we get cars. 
because cars not only move you across boundaries, they also make you um, anonymous in a sense and turn police people in or law enforcement officers into the people who are trying to reinforce boundaries in these sort of liminal areas, if you will. And I, and I use that word, I don't think she does. But she has a lot of stories about how once you're in a car, you think about your personal interactions with police, you tend to interact with police officers more frequently when you're in a car, and that helped to open the way for Americans to be much more comfortable with police being in their own frequent spaces than they were before we had cars, because you'd be like, oh, there's a police officer here, whereas now we're just used to seeing police everywhere because we have cars. I thought that was a really interesting argument. Sarah's book is great. I just put a link to it in the chat. Thank you so much for pointing that out. That's a really excellent resource for, for people. Esther, you get the last question this evening. Hi, I want to thank you for coming on. I really, you're a clear thinker, a clear speaker. And as a person who's not a history buff, I love the big picture context that you're able to give me on past and present events. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my quick question is, I turns out I've lived more than half my life in the South. And it feels very much like the Civil War really was not laid to rest, never ended. Uh, and we now have President-elect Biden, who is not considered legitimate by a significant minority within the country. So I guess what lessons should we take forward from the Civil War, post-Civil War era, so that we don't simply try to go back to what was, given that we do have the significant uh, part of the population that's questioning legitimacy. How do we take the lessons from the past and move forward to bring all of us together, as opposed to me still feeling in the South like the Civil War really never went away? Uh, that's a great question. And um, uh, I mean, there's a number of answers to it, but I think the most important answer is the one that I'm always trying to hit. And that is what killed Reconstruction is that Americans gave up on it. You know, they started to listen to the idea that um, helping uh, formerly enslaved people make the transition from enslavement to freedom was somehow socialism, it was somehow stealing from white people, that, that we weren't all in this together, that there was a limited pie and that people had to fight for their piece of it. And it didn't happen really because uh, people turn mean. It happened because a few very vocal people managed to commandeer the media, and an awful lot of Americans who didn't necessarily like the way things were going kept their mouths shut. And that's the piece that I'm always trying to push is, you know, in a democracy, the people who get their way are the people who make a lot of noise. And one of the things that I think was so successful in America during World War II and in the early 1950s was the real public push to say, hey, we're all included in this country. We are all in this together. Democracy stands against communism, yes, but it also stood against fascism. And that in order to be an American, and, and people are really articulate about this in the 1930s, late 30s, early 40s, and then and, and into the 1950s. If you remember, even Superman um, has long speeches where he talks about how, you know, if anybody in your school ever says that, you know, you can't be an American because you're Jewish, you tell them that that's un-American and that's not who America is, or if because you're a person, you know, he doesn't call people of color, but you, you get the gist here. So I think the answer to that is not to give up to say that American democracy is really about equality before the law and equality of access to opportunity or access to resources. And those two things right there are, it seems to me, no brainers, first of all, easily to easy to defend, but also things that it's, it's easy to think that we have when we really don't. And it is my hope that the more of us who articulate that and say, listen, you know, I'm not necessarily for or against, pick out any politician you want from any party you want. I am for everybody being equal before the law. And if people are not being equal before, are not equal before the law, that doesn't just affect them, that affects me, because it means that I don't have to be treated equally before the law either. And I think if we can keep that in mind and really insist not on going back to our day-to-day -day lives and saying, ah, what happens to people in 
Nebraska doesn't matter to me or what happens to people in Florida doesn't matter to me. I think that that will be the key finally to breaking um, to breaking up free of reconstruction and of the Civil War once and for all. We're going like to leave it one, there. Yeah, that's a great last point. Like I was just going to say that like maybe technology will show us each other so that every people who are in Nebraska don't feel so far away and feel like more a part of our communities and that will be the thing that changes but also at the same time I said that I was just thinking how we banned a troll today from like the chat and I just you know so it's like it's it's gonna be a little bit the no things for a while I think uh but thank you so much for coming on Heather um I don't know if you saw but we did a poll while you were answering the question and I'm like last time I checked it was a yes it was uh, and I don't this think is this is the most lopsided before. poll we have ever yeah. <laughs> had on In Lieu of Fun. That we basically um, asked, uh, should we have more historians on um, In Lieu of Fun, assuming the President Trump leaves office and a new immediate crisis does not arise? And we've had 100% votes for yes, and you are a huge part of that. So thank you for coming on and speaking with us. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, well, and it's a huge pleasure. Then, I'm a big fan of you guys. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to meet you properly. And uh, uh, someday uh, vaccinations permitting, we should do it in person. Oh, um, I'd love to do that. And, and so, there you go. And there's your answer to that. Here we go. Technology, realistically, how many of us would have met in real life, but but now we got to do it this way and now we will meet in real life and and there's another answer to how we save democracy is a lot of like-minded people now are on a first name basis that never would have met a year ago i there's a, some people in the chat that just sent me christmas cookies and my actual address my actual house that i still haven't met in person it's just and like somebody incredible. sent me a, another wooden pineapple i know um, exactly <laughs> so. So we will be back tomorrow, Christmas Eve, with Tim Miller. Um, Tim. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, he um, yeah. he uh, 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 will be with us tomorrow. That will be twenty-two hours and uh, forty-nine minutes from now. And until then, Kate. We don't have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun. We have pineapples and their history to match them. So thank you so much for giving us that story. We really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much, Heather. It was great to see you. See Terrific. you soon. Thanks a lot, everybody. Come back soon. Yeah, please. Anytime. Bye.